Well, good morning, Shannon Oaks family. It's great to see each of you here this morning. Monty, thank you for connecting uh, the Lord's Supper this morning with those who, uh, who've uh, really served our country. And, and uh, that was a great connection this morning. Thank you so much, brother, for doing that this morning. I want to... Uh, tell you if you are a guest today, we are really thankful to have you as well. I've, I've seen some this morning that I've got to hug and, and welcome this morning. We, we hope that every one when they came in received one of these bulletins. If for some reason you did not receive one, we're going to be using this in our service this morning. Would you raise your hand and we'll get you one right now. Did anyone not get a bulletin this morning? Our ambassadors do a great job of getting those out. So it looks like everybody got one this morning. That's fantastic. Well, we are uh, going to be asking you later on in our service to take the card that's inside your bulletin. And you'll see there's a, a box there. Here's what we'd like to ask you to do this morning. For example, today we're talking about some really important qualities that God seeks in leaders. This needs to be personal with you, though. You need to ask yourself this question this morning as we go through these qualities. I know that I'm reflecting on this because we're about to choose leaders in this church. But how am I doing on these qualities? How am I doing with what's going to be shared this morning that God seeks in leaders? Because every one of these qualities, they apply to us as well. Well, as you go through this list, maybe the Holy Spirit's going to convict you that there's something in your life right now that you need to lay before Him. There needs to be a transformation in your life. The box you have on this card is for that purpose. It's for you to put down a prayer request, maybe a praise to God, maybe a struggle you're going through. Because what we're going to do with these cards is at the end of our service, we're going to pass baskets, and these cards are going to be an act of worship from you to the Lord. So if you're a guest, we encourage you to do this. All of our members, we encourage you to do this as well. And then during this week, every day this week, our prayer team will be praying over these praises and these prayer requests every day this week. So please use this card as an act of worship this morning. Well, I mentioned to you we're in this series. It's called Pocketbook for Life in the Church. And we're in this little bitty book called Titus. Three chapters in this book. And we're really focusing on just chapter 1, the very first seven or eight or nine verses of chapter 1, as we as a church begin to consider what does it mean to appoint shepherds to lead a church? What does it mean to appoint elders that lead a church? This picture is a great picture. Because the picture before you is a picture of intimacy. This lamb is on the shoulders of the shepherd. And as we talk about what it means to be a shepherd in this church, foremost in our mind has to be this, that these are going to be men who I can turn to at any time for any kind of struggle, any kind of victory, any kind of failure. And they're going to be there for me. They're going to love me. You see, the beautiful thing about what the Lord did when, when he established the church, he gave us a family, a family of people that's different than our work family. It's different than our, our sporting team family. It's different even than our military family. There's something that connects us that's different than all of that, and it's the blood of Jesus. And we have people in this church who right now perhaps are going through struggles, who need someone to turn to. What we're doing during this series is we're asking God to open our eyes. Who are those men, God, that you want to lead this church? And so starting today at the end of our service, you can go back by the giving boxes and you can pick up what's called an elder nomination form, because I'm going to finish the, the qualities of a shepherd this morning. 
And any time in the next three or four weeks, you can take these cards and you can put them in the giving box by placing the name of the person that you believe that God has placed on your heart through your time of prayer, through your time of fasting, that this man would be a man who could lead this church. And you'll place these cards in these boxes, these giving boxes. The names of the people in front of you are those who are going to be taking these cards and praying over these cards and visiting with these people and praying with these people and then eventually submitting those names to our current church board here at Shannon Oaks to be considered as elders for our church. And so this is a really important process that we're going through here. One that we hope has been bathed in prayer and fasting and that you're allowing the Holy Spirit to lead you. So what we're going to do this morning is we're going to conclude this series. And as we go through here, I hope if you, if you have your, your bulletin there, you get a, a pen or a pencil. Because I'm going to share some of the, the qualities this morning in contrast to what we shared last week. So first of all, let's set the, 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 the foundation for where this study is coming from. When Paul writes this, this book, he's talking about the island of Crete. As we've mentioned before, Crete is located in the Mediterranean Sea, there between Asia and Europe and North Africa. It's about 100 miles south of Greece mainland. It's 160 miles long. At its widest point, 35 miles wide. And it's an island that, because it's got that proximity, had lots of trade, import, export, and all that goes with that. In fact, the island was known for not just its culture and its sophistication, but it's known for its immorality. In fact, the Apostle Paul, in verse 12, is going to tell us about these Cretans. He's going to say one of Crete's own prophets has said it. Cretans are always liars, evil brutes, lazy gluttons. And so here you have Titus, who's been assigned to this place called Crete to appoint elders in every city. It's been about 30 years since the Cretans were first there in Jerusalem and heard that first gospel message from Peter. Obviously, from, from what we see here, some of those folks accepted Christ, were baptized into Christ, stayed in Jerusalem, learned about what it meant to be a believer in Christ, and then went back home and began to plant churches. We're told here that Titus is to go to every city, and they're to appoint elders. Homer tells us there were over 100 cities on this island. So over these three decades, the church has exploded across this island. We began two weeks ago talking about what are the qualities that Paul says Titus needs to look for as he goes to these 100 cities. These men who are going to lead these churches, what should they look like? If you were to draw a character sketch, what would it look like? And two weeks ago we said, first of all, they must be devoted to their wives. They must love their wives as Christ loved the church. And then we said two weeks ago, they also must be fathers that love their children. Love their children to the extent that even as adults, their children love and respect them. And then last week, we focused on this verse, verse 7. And it's interesting that Paul changes gears. And here he talks about what an elder is not. And we talked about that character sketch artist sometimes working for a police force will find out and draw something, and the person who's seen the crime will say, no, that's not it, and that helps the person find exactly what that person looked like. And that's what Paul does here. He tells us what he's not. And so if you were not here last week, let me give you a quick review of what this person was not. Verse 7 says, 
For the overseer must be above reproach as God's steward, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not addicted to wine, not pugnacious, not fond of sordid gain. And so we said last week, this man that we're about to look for in this church, to lead this church, is not one who's consumed with self. He's not self-willed. He's not in love with himself. Because if he is, he will become stubborn. He will become arrogant in anything but what we need as a shepherd in this church. And then we said he was not easily angered. He's not quick-tempered. It's the idea of, of, being, of bursting forth with, with anger, of having under the surface anger, and, and then somehow you don't get your way and you blow up, and your hostility and your anger comes out. This is not to be a man who is a shepherd. And then we said this, Paul says, he is not to be one who is alongside wine. That's what the Greek actually means. Your translation may say addicted to, but it's one who, who has, doesn't always have to have a, something with him to fill him up whether it be alcohol or you can name any addiction in this world today, that kind of man is not to be one who is to be a shepherd here. And then we learned last week he is not to be violent. The word is pugnacious. And obviously in this day on Crete's Island, one way they solved their difficulties was by being pugnacious. The actual word in the, lex the old lexicon says this. It's one who gives blows. That they would solve their problems with their hands or their fist or a stick or a rock. And yet Paul said in 2 Corinthians eleven nineteen, talking about mature believers, for you being so wise, you bear with the foolish Gladly, you don't respond with your fist. So he's not violent. And then we concluded last week by saying this. The elder is not consumed with the material. Your version may say he's not fond of, of sordid gain. The two Greek words together, they're, they're compound words. They mean shameful gain. Someone who's after personal gain. He doesn't care how he gets the material. He doesn't care what he has to do as long as he gets it. And so Paul gave us a list of what the elder is not. Today, he changed his course. It's what we might call a coordinating conjunction. He's going to use the word but. This is what he's not, but. Now, this is kind of interesting, isn't it? Because whenever we think of the word but, usually it's the opposite of what Paul does. You go in for an interview, and the person sits down with you, and you come back for a second interview, and they say, well, you have this quality, you have this quality, you have this quality. And they say a lot of positive things about you. And then they say, but. And now you know you don't have the job. <laughs> Or maybe you're a salesperson, you go in and you, you put a proposal together and you sit down and, and the, the one you're trying to sell to says, well, this is good, this looks good, this looks good, but, and you know you've lost the sale. Paul's doing the opposite here. He starts with the negative first and now he says, but, this is what the elder looks like. This is him. This is the positive that the sketch artist can now begin to draw. And so I want you to open up your bulletin, take your pen. We're going to do seven quickly, seven quickly, and then we're going to close with a dynamite ending this morning. So here we go. First of all, he says, but this elder is hospitable. He is hospitable. The elder is hospitable. This is one of my favorite of all the traits that I read here in Titus. It really comes from two Greek words. And the words simply are this, phileo and xenos. And they mean that you love strangers. That you love strangers. 
It's also repeated in 1 Timothy 3, 2. In fact, it's repeated a lot of places. We could, we could do an entire sermon just on the importance of Christian hospitality. It's mentioned in Romans 12, 13, Hebrews 13, 2, 1 Peter 4, 9, 1 Timothy 5, 10. What this word simply means is this. Hospitality is opening up your life and your resources so you can know someone on a more personal level. And in this context, in the New Testament, it's talking about Christians with Christians. This is not an outreach verse. This is talking about Christians with Christians. That you might know someone's name, but let's be honest, they're really a stranger to you. You really don't know who they really are. If you just went through the Numa experience with us, we started off as strangers and we came out with great intimacy, knowing each other's strengths and weaknesses and loving each other as a spiritual family. That's what hospitality is. When I was uh, at Abilene Christian University, one of my favorite professors was Dr. John Willis. He was a scholar in the Old Testament. His classes were packed. You were lucky to get in there. Every semester, for every class he taught, every semester, every class he taught, one day, he didn't have class and invited the entire class to his home to eat with him. We had a hundred in our class. We were all in there, jam-packed. Can I tell you, on that campus, there was no one who was loved more than Dr. John Willis. Because something happens when you enter someone's home. The walls break down. It's different. Many of you know this story. In 2012, I was teaching a group of students. I was an eighth grade history teacher at the old middle school. And a group of kids that, that didn't have hardly anything came to me, and they knew I was a coach. They knew I could drive a school bus. I had a commercial driver's license. And they came to me and said, Coach Harris, we want to go to the banquet, the eighth grade banquet, in a special way. We, we, we don't have a lot. Would you drive us in a school bus? And so I got permission to do that. And then I asked them, where are you guys going to eat? And they said, Pizza Inn. I said, no, you're not eating pizza in. And some of you helped me with this. We opened up my home and we turned it into an Italian restaurant. And those 20 kids came to my house, my students. They ate in my home. And let me tell you, my relationship with them was different after that. For the next seven years, every Christmas, they ask us to host a Christmas party where they could all come back to our, our home, and we did that. I have married some of those eighth grade students that were in my home on that day. When people are in your home, everything changes. Your relationship changes. And this is what Paul says about these men. They're beyond the walls of this church. They want people to enter into their home lives, and they open their homes to people. I want to pause here and just say something that's very obvious here. As we go through all these qualities of what it means to be an elder, this one specifically you're going to understand. Don't we have to be talking about the wife too? I mean, if the wife is not supportive of what her husband is right now as a servant and as a leader, and what he's going to be as an elder, it's just not going to work, folks. It's just not going to work. It's just as important that the wife embodies what we're talking about, and especially on this topic of hospitality. So the elder is hospitable. I love that quality. Secondly, he's not just hospitable, but he loves what is good. The elder is a lover of good. This is two Greek words again, phileo and agathon. Agatha means good. You've probably known a girl named Agatha before. It means good. This means phileo, 
brotherly love. It's a lover of good. This man loves what is good. He loves what is true. You can look at his life and you can see who he surrounds himself with. What's he involved with? These are good things. Who are his friends? What does he do with his leisure time? What's precious to him? What's important? Is it good? Paul says, this is what you're looking for. A great text for this is Philippians 4.8. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, dwell. This is what this man does. Dwell on these things. So our man is hospitable. He loves what is good. And thirdly, he's sensible. And what we're going to say on this one is the elder is in control of his mind. Write this down. He is in control of his mind. Zozots is the Greek word for sensible here. And friend is the word for the other part of this word sensible. You combine these true Greek words, and here's what it means. This man is right-minded. He is in control of his mind. His thoughts are redeeming thoughts. He is able, when tempted, to rescue his mind from the gutter. He lifts his mind above the trivial. He has steady wisdom. Don't you want to be around a man like this? He has steady wisdom. He's a man with a cool mind, careful judgment. He's thoughtful. He's wise. He's profound. He has a disciplined mind. My favorite definition of this is he has disciplined wisdom. 1 Timothy 3.2 uses the word prudent. This is a man who is in control of, of his mind. And then fourth, the elder that we're talking about is one who is just. What does that mean? Well, we're going to write this down. He is one is able to respond with righteousness. You see, the word just, dikaios, in the New Testament it means righteous. So does this mean that the men we're going to pick are perfectly righteous men? Well, here's the problem with that. Romans 3.10 says this. None is righteous. No, not one. That's what Paul writes in Romans chapter 3. But that very next chapter, look what he says in Romans 4 or 5. And to the one who does not work but believes in Jesus who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. The blood of Jesus covers our sin. When God sees us, he sees righteousness. So what is this talking about? This is talking about how we respond to that. And this man responds to God's righteousness by striving to live a righteous life in worship to the Lord. He strives to live a godly life. And when God looks at him, he sees this man's heart, that the man is good. The man is striving to meet his standard, that he's right with the Lord, and others can see this in this man as well. Then the elder is devout. In fact, I would say for this word, let's just use the word devoted. He is devoted the actual Greek word here is a form of the word holy, hagias. But this word simply means that he seeks that which is holy. He seeks that which is pure. He seeks that which is unpolluted. Are we getting this theme over and over and over again? The men we're looking for are men who are in love with Jesus, they're in love with God, and they seek to walk as Jesus walked. That's the men we're looking for here. And finally, the elder 
is self-controlled. And on this one, what I'd like you to write down is this. The elder is a disciplined disciple. He has control of his life. He'll walk with God in the integrity of his heart. He is mature, and he can apply this maturity to the temptations and the struggles in his life. Does this man that we're looking at ever sin? Of course. Does he have failures? Yes. But the question is, where is his heart? Is he seeking to be one who wants the Lord to be in control? Is he disciplined in his study of the Word, in his prayer life, in his meeting with other believers that can encourage him? This is the man that we are looking for. Now, we, we've gone through all of these qualities. And then when you come to verse 9, this is really good stuff. This is what this man with all of these qualities ought to be doing. What should, what should we, we look for? What is this man right now in his life, what does he should be doing? Who is this guy? Verse 9. He holds fast the faithful word, which is in accordance with the teaching. So that he will be able to both to exhort in sound doctrine and to refute those who contradict. This is a man who is a teacher. Now, when I say he's a teacher, I do not mean that he is a preacher. He's not a motivational speaker. He could be. I mean, we could have some guys in here who were going to appoint elders who would come up and preach, but that's not what we're talking about here. What we're talking about is this is a man who's spending time with others and sharing the Word of God with them. He is one who could do what we see in Acts chapter 8 when you had that Ethiopian eunuch and you had Philip, and Philip starts right where that Ethiopian eunuch was, and he has an understanding of the word, and he can take him from where he is and tell him the story of Jesus Christ. That's the men we're looking for. These are men who, in this church, when people are going through struggles in their life, and maybe they're wandering from the faith, this shepherd can go up alongside them and lovingly say, don't you remember when you were baptized what you were telling the world? That you died to your old self, you were raised to walk in a brand new life, you wanted everybody to know that, what are you doing? A shepherd can do that. He knows the Word of God. He knows Romans chapter 6. What about when we totally blow it, when we totally fail? This shepherd understands. He can go to this person. He can say, let's open to Psalm 51. I want you to understand you're not alone in failure. David failed. Let's read this together. And just as David was lifted back up, you can be lifted back up too. This man knows how to open the Word of God. When someone's struggling with their faith, he can help them know from Hebrews 10, 17, God will remember your sins no more when you're in Jesus Christ. What we're talking about here is we're talking about one who can lead people in the relationship with Christ or can teach a non-believer how to come to Christ. They are all about the Great Commission, which is discipleship. There's a family that's been visiting our church. The man's name is Sean Bryan. We had coffee a few weeks ago, and I love Sean's story. Sean was convicted by the Lord to make a change in his life years ago. And man, did he ever make a change. He dedicated his life to start meeting with other men and discipling those men, taking them to the Word of God. And then he expanded that to work with families as well. He's been doing this on a weekly basis for 10 straight years. This is what we want in our shepherds. Are they discipling people? Are they helping us grow? Can we go to them when we fail? Can we go to them with a victory? Are they helping us be all that we can be? I hope in your mind you've got some 
men in this church in mind. I do. But I can't wait to, to put their names down. I've been concluding each of these messages with a shepherding story, and I, I want to close with one today. This man right here had a big impact on my life. His name is David. And back in 1979, as a very young man, I was 23 years of age, I was working for a church in Dallas. I had the responsibility to be the minister for 225 teenagers. I had 125 high schoolers that went to six different high schools. And I had 100 middle schoolers. I'd heard about this guy, and so I asked him to come to Dallas and spend time with me and help me as I face this incredible task in front of me. David had come up with a concept in youth ministry. And his concept was this. Just as Jesus had 500 and 120 and 12 and 3, that's the way we should organize our youth ministry. He called it the huddle program. And he came in, and he helped me to recruit 25 couples to come in. We put 10 or 15 kids in each of those couples' lives. We called them huddles. And then we, we would disciple those kids through those huddles. And then we'd encourage those kids to find two other people that could be accountability partners with them as teens. 120, 12, 3. David changed my life. In fact, the model that we're using here in this church for our life groups, you're getting that because David impacted my life. It's that model. He's impacted your life too. You may not know that, but he has. Because if you've been impacted at all by Israel Lewis, this is his daddy. This is David Lewis. I can remember that weekend in 1979, him calling home, and I remember names as he was talking to his wife of his children there. I remember they were biblical names. I didn't know who Israel was at that time. He had a little boy in diapers probably. So I want to tell you a shepherding story that, that I ask Iz to give me. Iz couldn't be here today, but this is Iz's shepherding story. He's typed it up for us. I'm just going to read it. Like most people, losing a parent was hard. I was blessed to have a special relationship with my dad. We talked on the phone or at least texted every single day. Dad was my best friend. After complications from a surgery in 2015... Dad started bleeding internally and became septic. It all happened so fast. I had no ability to prepare for losing him. I felt lost and all alone. The enemy tried to whisper, I was now an orphan. I shared my struggles with one of our elders at Shannon Noakes, Roger Elliott. The day of my father's funeral, Roger walked up, put his arm around me and said, I love you, son. One word, with one word, son, the shepherd let the lamb, me, know we are never alone. That is what we're looking for. Men who will be shepherds. I hope in this series I have been able to open up the word of God, to open up your hearts and your minds for who God wants to a point in this church. Let's, let's pray together. Father, as we have studied your word, it's my prayer, God, that you are opening our hearts 
in our eyes to the men that you want to bring forth as shepherds. The men who will put the sheep on their shoulders, who will be with us in our good times, in our struggling times. The men who will help me as the preacher in this church to have one I can go to, those I can submit to, I can pray with, I can confess to. God, give us men who will help this church be all it can be as a family. Help us be what you intended the New Testament church to be. Father, we, we love you for your word. We thank you for the people you've placed in this church. Prepare for us now as we go through these next several weeks of appointing elders. God, direct us. Keep us unified. Keep us together as a body. Maybe arise through this process stronger than ever. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. These qualities that we've looked at this morning, it's my hope that as we look at these, come on forward, prayer team, that as we look for these qualities, that you've examined your heart and your life this morning. If you're falling short in any of those, give it this morning to God. Leave here different than you came. Some of you may be at a place in your life where you need to come and you just want someone to embrace you like that picture and just pray with you. That's why we have our prayer warriors up here, to love on you and pray for you. Whatever is going on in your heart this morning, whatever is going on with you and the Lord this morning, we ask you this morning to open that up to the Lord. Give it to Him. Thank you for this morning, for your hearts. Thank you for the response you're about to give Jesus. I want to thank you ahead of time for that. Let's all stand together and let's sing.